back of Parkinson's, I, I painted this uh, picture of Parkinson's as a sort of way to structure uh, a whole range of information about the condition. And uh, the area down in the uh, bottom right of, of the screen is the area we're going to be looking at today. So we've got down there the whale of pain in the ocean of fatigue. Uh, and that's where we're going to start. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. Um, pain and fatigue, I mean, it's hard to classify them, you know, the non-motor symptoms. Originally, I was going to put pain into with autonomic and sensory symptoms when I was writing about uh, Parkinson's and all its effects. But then um, I was talking with our Parkinson's consultant about this and, and looking at the, the, the drawing that I'd done. And she said, well, you know, pain is it's hard to classify, really. And, you know, you could also put that into neuropsychiatric symptoms or cognitive symptoms as well as sensory. Um, so she actually encouraged me to take pain out of the sensory area and the autonomic area and to actually add it to the ocean of fatigue. Because actually this, again, can be one of those very background things about Parkinson's that people are living with sort of on top of all the other symptoms that, that we're more used to, to thinking about. So thinking specifically about pain first. Um, obviously, people with Parkinson's live with all sorts of different uh, comorbidities going along as, as life progresses. And there can be aches and pains that are for uh, specific reasons, musculoskeletal problems and injuries, all sorts of usual causes of pain. Um, but if people find that um, they, they go off and they seek solutions to some sort of persistent pain problem and it doesn't seem to be possible to, to find a proper cause or, or treat it successfully, then it can start to become possible that, that this is a Parkinson's pain. Um, some people seem to, to go through journeys where one of the very early symptoms of their condition is um, what we call coat hanger pain across the shoulder area. And I, I can remember a patient who came to our clinic having spent about five years struggling with this shoulder, neck and shoulder pain. She'd been through a lot of private treatment, including surgery to her, her neck, um, all completely unsuccessful. And then at the end of all of that, she eventually got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And, and this coat hanger pain turns out that for some individuals, that can be one of the very early non-motor symptoms of the condition. So it's, it's quite a hard thing to sort of unravel, really, with an individual. But if you, if you have um, conversations with someone with Parkinson's and they're talking about suffering with pain, it can be useful to start to explore a little bit more detail around that, whether it's a, a cyclical thing, if it's been investigated, if it relieves with, with sort of general uh, painkillers, paracetamol and things that would commonly be used. Um, or whether it's, it's a more um, resistant sort of pain and perhaps it follows a pattern. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for Parkinson's pain, as, as I think we mentioned in last week's session, to sort of build up at times when, when the drug levels and medication for the condition are at their low point the pain seems to build up. Uh, so in the small hours of the morning, sort of late in the night, when, it, when the sort of final dose of the evening's medication has worn off, uh, it can be quite common that pain starts to build at sort of three, four, five in the morning. But then when, when a dose of medication has been taken, the first dose of the day, it's quite common for that pain then to, to subside, only to return when the next dose of medication has worn off and another dose is due. That kind of pattern it is suggestive Parkinson's pain and this pain can occur anywhere in the body uh, and it can move around or it can be a very specific thing so it, it's quite a mysterious thing uh, and, and quite hard to, to get a handle on if, if you're not familiar with it I think a lot of people don't even realize to mention it to the Parkinson's health professionals because it, it's poorly understood um, GPs often would never, it wouldn't cross their mind, most GPs, that Parkinson's ha could have a pain element to it. Although King's College Hospital in London had developed a Parkinson's specific pain measurement scale about five years ago. So it is sort of known and, and more commonly uh, researched and discussed in, in the meetings. 
So just sort of outlining the territory, uh, moving on from pain, uh, thinking about mental fatigue in this ocean of fatigue that we've got surrounding that map of, of Parkinson's, as I call it. Uh, mental fatigue is a very specific thing. There's this kind of mental tiring a lot of people with Parkinson's find actually, again, can be um, something that can strike them quite early in the condition and have quite a significant impact on their, their ability to sort of pursue work roles, particularly um, to be able to concentrate, to focus, to, to get through the kind of general working day can become increasingly difficult for people. And they'll find that they just miss a lot, switch off, start to, to have a lot of difficulties with just sort of coping with, with the demands of ordinary life, let alone demands of, of work and other sort of uh, situations. Physical fatigue is, is yes, another feature of Parkinson's that we're often uh, encountering in, in people's accounts of, of what they're dealing with. And again, this can be something that, that comes in very early in the condition and again, has a big impact on people's ability to engage in kind of active roles in their life, whether that's work or in their sort of domestic life, uh, as well as in their leisure interests. So. Um, another sort of particularly challenging um, area for our patients to deal with and again very easily overlooked um, people feel that they are you know not trying hard enough perhaps and, and actually what they're battling with is this kind of actual tendency of the condition to be fatiguing and cause this rapid onset of, of feelings of exhaustion after even relatively short amounts of physical exertion you know, the exhaustion of getting dressed, you know, as we know from our patients, they can find just the whole process of getting their, themselves up and ready for the day is enough to make them need to have a sleep to, to get over that. So uh, continuing to outline some of these issues that we'll go on to discuss, wanted to think about uh, the little village that uh, I put onto the map here and, and thinking about Parkinson's and the many ways that it impacts on, on people in a sort of personal level uh, and also on their day-to-day -day lives. So thinking about uh, the many ways that people experience Parkinson's from the stage of their actual accounts being diagnosed. So often in our Parkinson's clinics, um, we may in an ideal world be involved in, in delivery of diagnosis, but Quite often people would turn up in, in a clinic having been diagnosed elsewhere. And, and the, the experience of being diagnosed is, is very variable, as you'll know. You know, it can be done in a constructive and supportive way. Um, but also, you know, some of our patients will, will have had far from ideal encounters. Um, I recall someone told me they had an encounter with their retired GP in a supermarket. Uh, and as a passing comment, the the, uh, the ex chief has said, "You know, you've got Parkinson's, of course," and walked away. This woman was left absolutely devastated because she didn't know, of course. Um, so the the lived experiences of people with Parkinson's, of course, are completely personal, uh, and we will come across individuals and a real diversity uh, of different issues that they're dealing with in terms of coming to terms with their diagnosis and then dealing with it. I mean, the, the com communication issues of people with Parkinson's make living with this condition much harder than perhaps comparable kind of um, other, I'm trying to think of, of other examples, but examples where that, that isn't got that sort of delayed hesitancy to the communication, that natural sort of damping down of, of expression, the kind of tendency towards apathy that we see in people with Parkinson's, all these things come in and, and sort of obstruct communication and have a, have a very um, direct impact on, on their life in the community, engaging. I mean, at the moment, we're all restricted, it's true. Um, but uh, on top of that, having Parkinson's it is even less um, likely to enable people to get out and participate outside their home and, and join in in recreation and le leisure let alone in, in the workplace so i think you know we, we do need to think about these things and, and keep ourselves acquainted now online there are many 
accounts of individuals, uh, many short films on YouTube and, and on the websites of the Parkinson's charities, of individuals talking about their experiences, particularly around things like getting diagnosed with the condition. Um, and particularly, I think, on in the younger age groups, some of the extraordinary struggles people have, uh, often years long of, of trying to find out what's the matter and actually getting to the point where they've received the diagnosis. So thinking then about, you know, this, this condition and, and how it impacts on people, um, once they've got the diagnosis, they've got to live with it and they've got to kind of get on with the life as well. And I think there are, there are many ways that in our clinical roles, we can support people in coming to terms with their diagnosis and, and looking at ways that perhaps they can start to sort of engage in, in things in a different way, but to carry on living. So I think it's very important for people to come to terms with the, the condition itself, but then to start to look at things like, you know, how they're feeling about socialising, those, those senses of embarrassment and stigma that often people have to struggle with. I and mean, it's not unusual for people to be completely misunderstood by those in, in their family and workplace or in their social life, uh, unless they reveal their Parkinson's. It, you know, I'm sure you've heard yourself from patients of people um, being accused perhaps of being drunk um, because of their slightly different way of walking and moving and the, the way they react, react to things and their slowness or incoordination. I've had people very, very hurt who told me that they've been accused of being drunk at 10 in the morning when they were going shopping. Um, and, and this kind of embarrassment, social stigma can then sort of lead on to people withdrawing both socially within their family, their friendships, and, and also with their work situation, if they're working. So I think it's very important for us to be aware of how people's kind of communication changes and ways that they can be supported into developing techniques to, to improve their communication and maintain that um, and also things around enabling people to deal with that kind of that social anxiety and the problems of, of mixing I think a lot of this is around quite honestly people often talk about how once they've come out come out so to speak to their friends and family and told uh, friends and family about their diagnosis that it generally makes things much easier Although there are many tales of people holding the, the, the diagnosis quite secret for a long time until they feel ready to disclose it to others. Um, and perhaps sometimes our role is, is to sort of support people to, to make those decisions and choose on their timing, particularly in, in things like disclosing of a diagnosis in the workplace to employers. Uh, and obviously the, the big implications that can have in the future so sometimes people need to kind of um, be supported to build up to being able to, to, to reveal to their, their manager in the workplace, perhaps in confidence, but hopefully also to their colleagues who can then uh, give hopefully suitable support and, and make reasonable adjustments to enable someone to continue to cope and participate in, in their work, perhaps in change roles. So there are so many impacts of this condition and so many ways it can affect people. I, I think it's really useful for us to kind of think through these things and um, just move on a little bit more to some of the sort of psychological aspects of this condition. So we've talked about the kind of shock of um, the diagnosis and, and for some people actually it comes more of a relief I think um, come across situations where people were fearing they had brain tumours and they were relieved when they, they found out it was actually only Parkinson's. Uh, but then there's those feelings of embarrassment and, and, and shame that people struggle with. Others are, are struggling with just coming to terms at all and, and want to block out the diagnosis and, and go through a period of denial that may go on for, for some time. Uh, and that can be particularly difficult for people who perhaps are starting on medication and perhaps getting um, a bit overheated with the medication, getting some behaviour changes and some impulse control uh, problems. And if they haven't actually come to terms with their diagnosis or 
reveal that to anyone, then you can see that that sort of situation could get quite out of control. So anxiety and worry are, are other common things that, that people are dealing with. Um, Parkinson's in itself tends to, to sort of bring in this kind of sense of isolation and detachment and apathy. On top of that, all the restrictions that we've got in the modern world. So people with Parkinson's often struggling a lot with, with loneliness. Um, and we're another way that uh, perhaps we can help to direct people back out towards others to connect with others as part of where, what, what we're doing. Uh, and then thinking about the, those kind of fears for the future, um, un, un, sometimes unfound fears. A lot of people are living with fears of um, their memories of Parkinson's back in the past, in generations gone by when people didn't have modern uh, treatment and medication and they were sort of confined to this kind of sleepy sickness state. Um, I've come across a lot of people, they're fearing, well, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, so automatically I'm going to be needing a wheelchair within a year, all those kind of um, illness uh, beliefs that perhaps are, are actually grounded on, on misconceptions about their situation. And then, then we have to think about people grieving, you know, the, the life they thought they were going to live, the retirement they'd been looking forward to, all the working life they'd been saving up for, and then suddenly they've got this diagnosis of, of Parkinson's coming. So there can be a whole grieving process around, uh, you know, learning that you've got Parkinson's and coming to terms with it. And then for some people, they're actually looking for something or someone to blame. Um, and, and sometimes people spend a lot of time trying to sort of work out, you know, what perhaps they did wrong or, or, or an event that happened to them that caused this, this thing to happen. So there's a whole raft of, of different emotions washing around there. And hopefully people aren't feeling all those things simultaneously, but it wouldn't be surprising if quite a lot of those things sort of feature in people's experience over the months and years of, of living with the condition. So sort of tying all this together and, and thinking about quality of life, there's a, a Parkinson's disease quality of life scale, which is called the PDQ uh, 39. And there's um, an abbreviated version with eight questions. So I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with the PDQ 39 or eight, uh, this quality of life scale, but um, it, it sort of basically either asks 39 questions or eight uh, of the, the top questions out of those 39, asking people about uh, common symptoms related to Parkinson's and how many times they feel that they experienced it, often, never, or occasionally in the past month. But um, I don't really find it a great uh, measure of anything myself. It's, it's useful in research settings, but as a, as a tool for, say, an OT, uh, assessment. I've, I've never really found it particularly useful because it doesn't actually give the quality of information about the context and the setting of, of particular activities, the relevance to an individual. So that's not really my preferred approach, but you'll see it in the research literature that often this will be a, a quality of life scale. But I think we know really that uh, helping people to follow the basic principles of, of sort of well-being and, and helping them to attend to these kind of different domains shown in this little mind map. But, you know, covering some of those main areas around well-being, I think um, will always do our patients good in relation to all of the things I've mentioned this evening, whether it's the pain, the fatigue, or these effects on the psychosocial uh, impacts, or these effects on, you know, the psychological life and the social life of, of these people. Thank you for your attention. We trust you have found this session interesting and that you'll make time to view other recordings in this six part series.